So another year in the bag, school's out, we're done. Formula One is finished for the year. Oh, however will we cope? I can harp on with the same old rhetoric about how boring the season was and about how we long for a season like 2010 to just magically appear again. And I mean, I wouldn't necessarily be wrong about that, but now's the time to have some fun. Happy attitude, everyone. Good old, good old happy times. So as we do every year, we're gonna go through all the drivers that competed in Formula One this season and grade them on how well or poorly they did. Pretty simple formula. It's grading from A plus straight through to F. Everything is being taken into account here. So having one good performance in an FP1 session that was red flags after 10 minutes ain't gonna save anyone's ass here. Nor is one bad performance gonna deliver a driver an F. We are fair on this channel. Except when we're not. Before we delve into this list, however, it is time to announce the Driver of the Year. A long-standing, long-running, two-year tradition on this channel. Now, there were some good candidates. In Formula Regional this year, Kimi Antonelli absolutely tore it up, winning both the European and the Middle Eastern titles in his debut runs. And now he's on the fast track to Formula 1, skipping over Formula 3 for 2024 and going straight in to Formula 2. Impressive. But when it comes to winning two championships in the same year, it's not quite as impressive as Rotomo Miyata in Japan, who completed the Super Formula and Super GT double. To win both of Japan's premier championships, especially with the competition that's in there, is nothing to scoff at. To delve into motor bicycling is out of my wheelhouse, but Jet Lawrence absolutely dominated whatever he raced in this year. And domination is the right word because Look at this. Like, seriously, this year was ridiculous. Those are the same words that I would have used for Alex Pillow in IndyCar. At some points this year, he was literally unbeatable. His form was such that people began to ask the question, should he be in Formula 1? Well, maybe. But then he would have to go up against the 2023 Driver of the Year. Yeah, you all saw this coming. And really, was there anyone else? Say what you want about the RB19, but the speed and form from Max this year was unbelievable. His speed was incredible. He drove like an angel and he defended like Surfshark VPN. In other words, flawlessly. Hey, 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 come on. You know I'm right. Because you know as well as I do that our reliance for online stuff has been rapidly increasing. From streaming to keeping in touch with our loved ones to online shopping for Mr. Santa Claus. I mean, we would like to think our information is safe, but as our online footprint increases, so does the need for proper security. If you don't already know, Surfshark is a VPN service that protects your information by encrypting all the data that you send through the internet, keeping prying eyes from getting at it. Like, seriously, you really want what you've been browsing to be exposed? But wait, that's not all. Have you at all noticed that content can be restricted based on your geographical location? Well, with Surfshark, you can solve that problem by simply changing your location. Not only is this good for people who want to keep up with their favorite shows, but it can also be a vital tool for those who live in countries that, for some reason, feel the need to heavily censor their people. It ain't quite teleportation, but it is about as close as we're gonna get right now. So, here's the Surfshark offer. Use my link in the description. Enter the promo code Josh Revel and you can get a Black Friday special offer of five extra months for free with the Surfshark One package. Which means for something like a couple of bucks a month, you have got the security of Lance Stroll's race seat. Actually, is that fair to say now? Meh. Plus, you're gonna get those three free months and a 30-day money-back guarantee as well. So what the bloody hell are you waiting for? Oh, right. Well... Let's get into it. At the very start of the year, a mountain of hype surrounded a man who, as it would turn out, would crash and burn so horrifically that you almost had to wonder whether it was all part of some weird kink of Dr. Helmut Marco. We all know how brutal the Red Bull system is with their drivers, but what happened with Nick DeVries was just a little bit rancid. To be given only 10 races, and perhaps not even that, to prove your worth in Formula 1 is flat out not enough time. It was a very harsh axing, no matter what your views are. Having said that, in the races that he did have, he was hardly impressive. Quite a few mistakes crept into his weekends, and while, yes, he was technically a rookie, there was some amount of expectation around him, given the mileage he already had in F1 machinery and his prep heading into the season at AlphaTauri. Not a lot of people would have kept him on board with how he performed. It's just the way it all ended gave everyone a sour taste in their mouths. It really wasn't that fair. But when you think about it, when you think about how the drivers who replaced him fared, was it really that unfair? I mean, take Liam Lawson, for instance. 
after being given the unenviable task of taking over the seat of a car that he had never driven before, driving on tires he'd never tried before, and given only 90 minutes of prep before having to qualify it for a Grand Prix, you'd forgive any person who at that point decided to sneak out before their inescapable doom. Instead, he kept it on the island and delivered a fairly commendable performance. Then in Singapore, he delivered again in a big way, getting points in his second race, something De Vries could not do in 10. Suzuka was a performance where you could argue that he outperformed his teammate? Did he do that in any of the other events? No. But whether he did or not isn't really the point. And anyone who did expect that is being completely unrealistic. What he delivered under those circumstances was beyond what was expected. And that's all you really could ask of the guy. I'm not entirely sure that he'll get another shot at Formula 1. Sure, there's promises, but no guarantees. You can't say, however, that he didn't give it his best shot. So that's two rookies to kick this whole thing off. How's about looking to the land of the somewhat free for the third? When the dust settled in the hours after the checkered flag had fallen in Austin this year, Logan Sargent became the first American in 30 years to score a point in Formula 1. Who cares that he finished 12th on track? Y'all are just nitpicking at this point. <laughs> nah, really. How has he been this year? Because if popular opinion is anything to go by, this guy should have been thrown to the wolves and replaced with Mick Schumacher. And well, yeah, his year has been littered with mistakes and his qualifying form has been atrocious, being completely dominated by his teammates. He has been closer to that teammate of his than we either notice or care to admit. Over the second half of the season, there was some noticeable improvement and for a rookie nowadays, he hasn't been that bad. Having said that, he wasn't all that great either. And I am a bit skeptical as to whether or not he'll improve substantially in his second year in the game. And he's gonna have to, because there are major prospects in junior racing that may be only one year away from being ready to take on Formula One. So, I mean, I guess you could say he's living on borrowed time a bit. Maybe he can get a second lease at life, like Kevin Magnussen did. Having said that, I'm not sure where exactly that guy sits right now either. At the start of the year, when Haas were looking slightly okay, there was one driver that seemed to be making a world of difference, and his name was not Kevin Magnussen. But as the second half of the season came around, the pendulum swung a little bit, and now Gunter Steiner had the ever-present migraine, reminding him that he had just fired a driver 12 months ago, only to end up with results not that much different from now. With K-Mag scoring most of Haas's points finishes this year, it is perhaps a little unfair to say that he hasn't had a good season, but he's had too many appearances on the wrong side of Q1, and in times where his teammate was getting into Q3, that just isn't good enough. Which is strange, because it could have sworn that he had done better this year, and I'll echo those exact same sentiments with Joel Gon Yu. Now, yeah, Mans has some killer threads and his lids are amongst the best on the grid. By that token, he deserves to stay on the grid for 170,000 years. And there have been a fair few times this year where he's put on some pretty good performances. But the thing is, they haven't been as frequent as we thought they were. Even superhero performances, such as qualifying in Hungary, were balanced out by terrible ones, such as the race in Hungary. Then you look at the pace deficit to his teammate. Sure, that guy is a 10-time race winner, but he ain't in a Mercedes no more. And even his form has been been relatively questionable over the last 18 months. But race winner, rookie, world champion, it doesn't matter. Your teammate is still your teammate. That is who you have to perform against. And when you're losing the qualifying and race battles this badly, and with two seasons under your belt, we have to pose the question, is Jo Guan Yu really the dude that should be in that second Sauber seat? If he is, he needs to sort out that deficit and, in some respects, bury his teammate. I mean, that's Formula 1. I know it sounds cruel, but it really is survival of the fittest, especially against teammates, no matter how you accomplish it. Like, just ask Daniel Ricciardo. After drowning like a blontine in a horror movie during his last year at McLaren, no one really expected the Honey Badger to return to racing in 2023. But after Marco's gamble on passports backfired on him, the smiling assassin was called upon to fill the void. And immediately, it turned out to be the right call. Hungary was a decent outing. Spa was... Well, meh. But after returning from injury, he started to deliver. And in Mexico City, he proved again to everyone why people in the paddock hold him to high regard. Not every performance has been great, it must be said. And it's a big if as to whether or not he has much more in reserve. Whether or not he could take the fight to the three-time reigning world champion. And yeah, I say that knowing what happened in the past. But times are different. And just for now, at least, it's just good to see Daniel Ricciardo back in a Formula 1 car that does not look at a corner in the same way that Nico Hulkenberg looks at a podium. You know, it's funny. 
money because in round three this year, he almost got one. But that's the story of his life, nearly getting the podium. For the first half of the year, Hulk was the gleaming light for Haas. Jean and Gunther having him borne aloft on a golden throne to each race as the Haas again went through the motions of starting out pretty well before remembering that it had an Italian heart. But even as the form of the car began to fade away, what you wouldn't expect is for the form of the drivers to go along with it. But you do get the sense that the magic we saw from him at the start of the season flew into the Bermuda Triangle of Formula 1. And especially in race trim where even if he qualified well enough on Saturday, he disappeared just as fast on Sunday. So what we've got here is two relatively average ratings from Haas. Perhaps the car is masking their efforts a little bit. But having said that, whenever you have a star standout driver in a car like that, you typically see a sign or two that we're just not seeing now. That's kind of the story with Sauber right now too. And I know, all of this sounds way too harsh, but if I were to be fair to these drivers, well that would just be boring, wouldn't it? It is a bit difficult for these guys to offer up a defense. Although that wouldn't really matter for Valtteri Bottas because defense has never really been his thing. It is a bit telling about how his year has been when you don't quite know what has been more memorable, his driving or his ass calendars. Although much like Haas, quite a bit of that could be down to the car. How the hell can you truly prove yourself when the car leaves you in midfield hell with no prospect of points unless Ferrari be themselves? There have been morsels this year of the Valtteri that we know of, the one that can extract just about everything out of the car, some standout performances which were masked by factors outside of his control. But the main thing is that he has clearly had the measure of his teammates and as long as he keeps on doing that, there's not a lot of reason to get rid of him because in this sport, beating your teammate is everything. That said, Salba is nowhere near as brutal as the Red Bull program. At Alpha Tauri, drivers typically never last beyond a third year. So I guess Yuki Tsunoda must be shaking like Wesley Snipes in an IRS building. At the beginning of the year, not a lot of people were confident that he would survive the year. I mean, hey, I was one of those. His new teammate was a go-karting prodigy, a Formula 2 champion, a Formula E world champion, the works. Yet Yuki had his measure, very clearly. He lived to fight another day, and if anything, he started to look like a million bucks. The car was slow at the start of the year, but his remarkable consistency brought on some awesome results. However, once Lawson and Ricardo came into the team, the competition ramped up and we started to see the mistakes again. And while Yuki was the faster driver over Liam, barely, when it comes to Ricardo, well that's a little bit more complicated. What's the conclusion to draw from Yuki's season? Well, that it was pretty good, but there is an asterisk. Had Danny Rick been his teammate for the calendar year, I seriously doubt that Yuki would have stayed ahead of him in the driver's standings. And the mistakes, one could argue, would have been double what they were this year. In your third year of Formula 1, you've got to be able to harness that, because eventually, the powers that be are going to run out of patience. I mean, just ask Alex Albon. He knows all about it. Thankfully though, the pain and abject misery is behind him. He's no longer having to fight for fourth, fifth or sixth in a Red Bull. He's having to fight to even get in the top 10 in Williams. It doesn't sound much better but when you get those results, it's somehow more rewarding. Less is more. Apparently, over the last few years, we would hero worship anyone who could get points in a Williams. But to Albon, well, that's just Sunday. Williams are nowhere near back to their glory days, and we would all love to see them head back to the promised land, a la the days of the Brummy Mammoth. Yeah, the odd knuckle-headed gymnastics didn't really help his crusade, but for the majority of the year, Albon has been a fast, reliable driver, extracting the most he could out of that car and getting valuable points for the team, with the Canadian Grand Prix being but an example of what he can do. Ferrari are supposedly interested in him. And I ain't surprised. Although I am somewhat surprised that they are looking for something a little bit less chaotic. They could of course take a huge punt and hire, say, Esteban Ocon? Wait, what? What did I mean by that? Well, I'll talk about that in a second. For now, let's discuss how was Ocon's season of 2023? In a word, very good. No, wait, that, that's two words. But I guess that's appropriate because he seems to be delivering more. Alpine are in a weird limbo right now, where the car isn't bad, but it's not really great either. With other cars around them yo-yoing around all the time, they're getting caught in a rut, where they should have placed much better this year than they actually did. But it wasn't for lack of trying on the driver's part. Ocon's performances such as in Monaco and Las Vegas were exceptional. Here was a dude who was clearly quick and could deliver the goods for the team most of the time. He is proof that Alpine have a solid, solid line. Lineup. However, there have been times this year where he caved into his 
inner Frenchness, which was slightly unhealthy toward his task of finishing a race. There was something else too. When he broke ranks in Vegas, disobeyed team orders, passed his teammate and went off to save his own skin, it provoked memories of the 1982 French Grand Prix. And if you're unfamiliar, that's not a good thing because it effectively dissolved the partnership and melted the team from the inside out faster than one of their turbos did and that is saying something. Alpine just can't afford to have that happen here too because Ocon has been pretty damn good, but slightly better I would argue has been Pierre Gasly. To go up against a dude who gave a two-time world champion an itch is a hell of a marker. To beat him straight up would have been kind of unrealistic, but in the qualifying battle this year, Gasly won. And while Esteban could claim that he got a podium in Monaco, Gasly also got one in Sandvoort. Gasly has exceeded most expectations put upon him this year. The level of competition in that team, combined with getting settled in and all other bits of witchcraft that comes when moving house, none of that really seemed to perturb him. It wasn't the perfect year, but then again, only one person on the entire grid had that. Even with what we know he could do, he did kind of surprise us this year. And this could only be a good thing for Alpine to have two very strong drivers in their lineup, both of whom are just as good as each other, both of whom could score valuable points for the team. So, Aston Martin, are you listening? Because despite Lance Stroll displaying a decent first and third act of the year, the middle part of the season was plagued with performances that rivaled that of a sloth in a rave. Coming back from injury so soon at the start of the year was commendable, and for the first few races he actually wasn't that bad. But from there, the consistency was horrendous. Unacceptable actually. Some bad mistakes seeped in, and the pace deficit to his teammate was bad. Then, for whatever reason, he began to wake up post Qatar, and in Sao Paulo and Las Vegas, he was starting to look like a born again Ayrton. But while the end of the year was decent for Sir Lancelot, we can't be under any illusions here. For 2040 11 years now, we've been talking about the same damn thing. Consistency. The f consistency. And that consistency issue might very well have cost Aston Martin fourth place in the constructors' standings. That is a lot of money lost. When your teammate has breached the 200 point marker for the year, yet you couldn't even get close to 100, it makes those few good performances that he has had not quite as important as all those other bad ones. If he is to stay in Formula 1, he needs to sort it out now. The excuses end here. They should have ended three years ago. He's no rookie anymore. But even then, some would argue that Oscar Piastri, who himself was a rookie, showed better stuff this season. Actually, that's not too much of an argument, isn't it? Were there consistency issues? Yeah, a little bit. But you would expect that of rookies. With the limits on testing and other handicaps young drivers are faced with nowadays, expecting a rookie to come firing out of the gates with no issue whatsoever isn't just unrealistic, it's straight up delusional. Yet, with Oscar Piastri, you get the sense that he's one of the better prepared rookies we've seen in a long time. Once McLaren completed the greatest turnaround in form since Burger King stopped selling horse meat, we began to see Piastri's performances a little more clearly. Then the podiums came. Then he got his first sprint race win in Qatar. And throughout the whole time, he emanated a sense of calm and cool-headedness that we just don't see from many drivers nowadays, who, if you told them they were losing 0.1 of a second per lap, would throw their steering wheel across the garage and initiate a hunger strike. Translated from bullshit into English, what I'm trying to say here is that Oscar Piastri has showed a lot this year, and there is more to come. He's showing all the key ingredients of a future world champion. And, you know, I thought the same thing a couple years ago with George Russell, but after the season that he had, I gotta start wondering whether I jinxed him or if I was just a little bit wrong. Becoming a meme at the start of the year was about as good as it got for dear old George. The battle between he and his final boss of a teammate was relatively close at the start of the year. He was on fire in Melbourne, both figuratively and literally. But then the upgrades started to come in. From that point on, the battle was clearly slanted and Mr. Russell was not the beneficiary. That's not to say, however, that the deck was stacked against him. After all, you do have to work with what you're given. In qualifying trim, he remained fairly solid over the course of the season, but his race results have been pretty average when you look at them on paper, and it has severely hurt him in the driver's standings. Mistakes in Canada and Singapore, for instance, were about as welcome a sight for Toto Wolff's eyes as an invitation to Christian Horner's bar mitzvah. It's not totally gloom and doom. We have seen morsels of the guy throughout the year, and we know what George Russell can do, which is what has made a lot of this year a disappointment. Can you hear that? Yeah, that's the sound of Charles Leclerc's car, because it isn't running. Huh? Get it? Get it?
I'll see myself out here. The misfortune for Shao this year has been bordering on laughable to a joke. Whether it be mechanical issues, betrayal by the laws of physics, or Ferrari's somewhat liberal attitude to common sense, there is no denying that so many damn points have gone begging. He hasn't been totally immune from culpability, it must be said. Throwing his cut into the sandbox in Melbourne was slightly ill-advised. But there were a lot of positives that came from this year. He showed a hell of a lot of speed. Five pole positions, however they came, getting onto the podium five times and performing clutch moves that had everyone weak at the knees. In 2022, Ferrari started out extremely well, looking like the team we all wanted them to be, before falling away as the season went on, arriving at rock bottom and proving that Enzo died in vain. This year, however, it's been the other way round, and that's encouraging for next year. I mean, I hope, but that uptick in form has to apply to both Charles and Carlos Sainz, because it's not as if he's had bulletproof reliability this year either. Whatever the argument may be for Leclerc's misfortunes, it shouldn't dilute the good stuff put in by Sainz. He may not quite have the outright speed and raw pace of Charles most of the time, but he's still damn solid enough to be able to pick up the pieces when the prancing Hans decides to rear its head. In races such as Singapore, he proved that sometimes he can actually be better than the man himself, using Lando Norris as a form of defense, keeping him just close enough to give him DRS and ward off a Merc attack, but just far enough away so that Lando wouldn't catch him with his draws down. So close, yet so far for Lando in terms of getting his maiden Grand Prix win. By all means, he should have had one by now, but he has been a constant nearly man this year. Once McLaren finally found themselves, however it came to be, Lando finally found himself in contention for podiums on the regular, and in the event that the Red Bulls engaged in a rare occasion of being mid, for victory. It never happened for him though, which is a shame because most of the year was exceptional from the lad. His streak of four podiums from Singapore to Austin was the longest on the entire grid by one driver. Even when McLaren were in the trenches at the beginning of the year, Lando shone there too. 2023 was a weird year for that team. It started off all doom and gloom before eventually morphing into so much promise. It was the complete opposite for Aston Martin and that was a shame as for a while it appeared that we would see the first win in 10 years years for Fernando Alonso. We didn't know heading into this year whether the Lord of the Eyebrows had pulled off a stroke of genius in his move to Aston, or whether this was but another cursed career move that slowly disintegrates while he watches helpless. And to start off with, it appeared that it was the former. Podium after podium after podium, stellar performances left, right and center, it just felt right. Watching Fernando tear it up in a car that was finally competitive for him, he absolutely demolished his teammate for the vast majority of the year. It might not be a high bar, but you play the hand you dealt. He fell away a little bit toward the tail end of the year, but he still wrangled a podium out of it with a legendary last lap tussle with a car that was much faster than his own at the brilliant Interlagos. I do fear though that his time at Aston may have peaked already. If that's the case, he's in for more of the same familiar pain that he's become accustomed to ever since Renault banished the color blue. But so long as he can have a competitive enough car, it is still an experience to watch the master at work. And while with Mercedes the grass is a slight tad greener, you can say the exact same thing about Sir Lewis Hamilton. I don't have a better segue. Sue me. 2022 was a strange year in that Lewis did not achieve a win either on track or in the teammate battle. The hope for many was that 2023 would be the complete opposite. That he would come in, superman the field, win 34 out of 22 races and create world peace. That didn't quite happen. But this year, we kind of saw something else from Lewis. He was certainly the better driver in the teammate battle at Merck despite some of the problems at various points in the year. And while Russell's position in the standings is offset with some points that have on begging, a slew of podiums coupled with the pole position in Hungary when the car was still being as recalcitrant as a cat in a bath gives Lewis a rating like this. Sure, not perfect, and it may not have been a 2020 style domination year from him, but you can only perform as well as your car, and there's not a hell of a lot that you can fault him over for this year. You sure as hell wouldn't think about letting him go. Whereas with Sergio Perez, the answer to that has more recently been one of uh, um, maybe? Uh, I don't know. And as a fan of the guy, it pains me to say that because we know what Checo can do. The early part of the year proved that, or at least on paper it did. And lest we forget the time in 2019 when Valtteri Bottas looked like a giant slayer before eventually melting once Lewis started to be himself. Every single person watching though knew just how hard it was going to be for Checo to mount a full-on assault at the title. But no one expected him to struggle as badly as he did while his teammate was running away, winning everything 
everything in sight. Checo was hard pressed to just make it onto the podium. He outlined his inability to adapt as quickly as one of the reasons behind these struggles. Not much of an excuse, but as someone else has mentioned in some faraway region of Formula 1 Reddit, in 2021, Checo finished fourth in the standings. In 2022, he was third. And this year, he finished in second place. If these trends continue, hey! But I don't know. What Checo struggled with this year, Max Verstappen had no such issue with. You could talk about the car all you want, I don't care. This year was one of the most impressive seasons I have ever seen from a Formula 1 driver. Not simply because he won races, it was how he controlled the race. Nay, the weekend. Even when he would struggle with the car setup on Friday, when he would occasionally miss out on pole position to give us all some f***ing hope, come Sunday, he would turn full on Superman and remind everyone that yeah, he is all that. We can start the conversation about just how great this guy is. And pretty much most of the year, he did that. They're talking about AI taking over, but why bother when you could just clone their old match here? I'm talking up a lot of stock here, but how can I not? How can anyone not? Because apart from his heated conversations via comms, his tendency to tango with other drivers, and those few races where he didn't take the win, it was virtually flawless this year. When you maximize you and your car's potential over 20 times a year, you end up with two things. A points total that's as bloated as a beached whale, and a rating that looks like this. So that's 2023. What'll happen next year? Well, I know some of you are hoping for a much more interesting season, and hey, I'm right there with you. But until then, um, something something, don't be a manus, and I'll see you all later.